with thinking what you're talking about you know if you were physically disabled or something to that effect and whether you're physically disabled or not there are people who do this wallowing in in, in, in it and wallowing self-pity and the two things I, I say about that first of all i don't go to pity parties i don't send me an invitation i won't come <laughs> There's usually not any really good cake or beverages, and it's usually a downer attitude. So we don't want to go to those. And number two, that is called a victim mentality, and that will hold you back in life. You cannot play the victim, and we have a lot of people who play the victim who are not disabled um, in all arenas, including political arenas. Uh, we 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 love the victim mentality. Oh, poor me! And everyone should feel sorry for me, and everyone should understand me, and nobody understands me but people like me. Yeah, well, it's not the job to understand you. It's your job to to look at the things that are in your life that are um, holding you back and look at them in a different lens. Don't look at them as barriers or obstacles. Because when there's a barrier or obstacle in front of you, you get so laser focused on it. All you see is that. So you got to start looking at them, like I said earlier, as challenges. And a challenge is something you could take on and more than likely overcome. And if you don't overcome it, you're still going to be a stronger person for trying. Welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. I have a wonderful gentleman here with me today. Uh, Chris Mitchell's here with me. We're going to be talking about all things to do with his journey as an author. And I'm so excited to have Chris here. Such a great person. Uh, you're going to love him. Chris, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. Thank you for having me as a guest today. It's exciting to have you here. Chris, tell everyone listening where you are in this big world of ours. I'm in <clears throat> the southwest corner of the state of Missouri in the United States, so I'm a little bit south of you. I'm near the um, Arkansas, Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Missouri border, and near Joplin, Missouri. There you go. Beautiful. Great to have you here, Chris. Um, tell us a little bit about your author journey. I'm sure there was a point in your life where you would not have considered yourself to be an author. And now here you are today, a published author. So where did all this start for you, Chris? How did your author journey begin? Well, uh, in 2002, I had to undergo an ascending to descending aortic bypass. And during that procedure, I survived in a incomplete spinal cord injury known as a ischemic stroke to my spinal cord, and it robbed me of the ability to run, walk, or even stand. And in 2011, about nine years later, it's coming to ten year anniversary. And one of the things I'd done over the last nine year, the previous nine years, was I would look back and see all the things that I was able to do that I could not do initially after my incomplete spinal cord injury. So. As a gift to myself, I decided I'm going to write a book about my journey and to celebrate how far I came in my first 10 years after my incomplete spinal cord injury. This was a gift for myself to recount and celebrate how far I've came. And I wanted to make it a gift to others who have a similar injuries, whether it be an incomplete spinal cord injury or any other physical disabilities, to show them that... Um, Recovery is possible, and I wanted to write a book where, for people who had a physical injury, maybe a stroke, because mine was called an ischemic stroke to the spinal cord, which is a stroke to lay people, a spinal cord medic, uh, medical community. For those who had a stroke, um, maybe give their caregivers or loved ones an idea of what they're going through if that person has lost the ability to verbally communicate with the outside world. Mm. So that's the one thing about strokes, uh, Chris. I know in my circle of friends and family, it's impacted our family and friends where someone who seems healthy and everything's great one day and then the next day, things change dramatically. And everyone is shocked. Everyone is uh, surprised, and then the inability to speak on top of that. Like, there's got to be some things mentally that are going on in the moment during those early days that are very hard to explain how how somebody feels, whether it's the family dealing with someone who's had something traumatic like this happen, and then for the person that's dealing with it, just the loss of 
of how things were just like hours before. Can you kind of explain mentally what what's going on and what you were kind of experiencing in that moment? Now, when I had my my injury, uh, my incomplete spinal cord injury, which is like I said, a, presents as a stroke to lay people okay. um, medically as a spinal cord injury. I really did not have any trouble communicating okay. um, at all. Uh, I I was very verbal, very vocal, and uh, used a lot of sentence enhancements because I'm very frustrated. Yeah. Because I went into the hospital for surgery and I did not expect this to happen, and I wound up in a um, rehabilitation hospital and I used the a lot more, well, well, those who watch SpongeBob will get this reference, sentence enhancers, which is another polite way of saying profanity. <laughs> uh, while I was there, because I was very angry that a month ago, I was able to walk from one side of the town I lived in all the way to the other. And now I needed help with somebody. I needed someone to help me get out of my bed and get dressed each morning. And it was very frustrating to me. Thankfully, uh, at that time I was engaged and my fiance was extremely supportive. She came to the rehab hospital every morning and helped me get up and spent the entire day into visiting hours were over to help take care of me and, and encourage me to recover. But it was very upsetting and frustrating and fright frightening because frankly, I did not even know if I would ever be able to return home. I'm engaged. And I thought, I, I need to get back home. I want to get back to my house because I want to make sure my fiance gets a happily ever after every girl dreams of. And I wanted a happily ever after. This was not my plan for my life. So it was very scary and frightening time for me. And I did um, verbally express myself quite well and with quite colorful language. It's nice to have someone there to support you through this. You know, uh, that's, I can't imagine how somebody could experience something like this and, and try to do it alone. That is, that's scary, right? So, yes, it is. Um, how did your bond between the two of you grow during that time together? Uh, well, it grew. At, we we were close to begin with. We had been dating for two years, and we got engaged. And it, it was no question for her to be there by my side, day uh, all day. And prior to me being in the rehab hospital, I was at a. Um, was called a short-term hospital, which is like a standard hospital most people go to. And she stayed there 24 hours a day to take care of me. And the about nine months, no, about 10 to 11 months after my incomplete spinal cord injury, we lived in California at the time. So it's a law that you have to have marriage counseling before. Um, and the minister met us. We told him our story. And he said, look, if you two could survive what you've been through, you'll be fine. I'm going to write off that you had the marriage counseling because I have no doubt that you guys are going to stay together. So nice. it has brought us very close together. Um, I'm, I wish we had found a different way to become closer <laughs> together, but I'm glad that we are this close. I, I could, I would have preferred a better way, but I'll take what I got. So Chris, give us an update on where you're at now today. Okay. Um, about seven years after my injury, uh, the insurance company has stopped paying for my outpatient therapy about a year after. So about mm. six, seven years later, I have, I taught myself how to walk again using a rollator before then I was confined to a wheelchair or a scooter. And I, I just decided I'm going to teach myself how to walk. So I'm able to um, walk with a rollator longer distances. I still got to use an electric scooter because this is too much walking for me at this point. And I can dress myself, feed myself. I can do all the ADLs activities of daily living by myself. And, 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 you know, I still have a little bit of pain, but I still believe that there will be a day I'll be able to uh, walk again. I might not be able to walk across town again, but I do believe there'll be a day I can take some steps. And I already have started that in the house. I could take one or two steps at a time without holding on to anything. As long as I'm in a safe area that if I feel like I'm going to fall, I can grab onto something. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> Chris, that you can, you've made that kind of progress. That's incredible. And what, if someone's listening, Chris, and they're, they're not feeling motivated to get up and try and do the work to regain some of that ability to, to walk on their own, what kind of, what kind of encouragement would you give them to get up and and do their best with to the best of their ability? Yeah, you got to do that. You got to get better at um, where you are. You can't stay stay at the same level because life is all about growing. Uh, and as long as we're growing, we're not dying. And the the thing that um, helped me was, like I mentioned earlier, when I was in the hospital, 
right after the injury, I, I, I basically could not do anything. I had trouble, had spasticity in my hands, which means my fingers kind of went any direction they wanted to at any time they wanted to. And I had trouble opening up a milk carton. And I was set a goal that today I'm going to open a milk carton on my own. And that sounds very trivial after being able to, you know, um, cook my own meal at home. <laughs> but, you know, I set that as a goal. I did that. And I celebrated that at the end of the day, because each day at the hospital, my fiance and I, at the time she's my fiance, we've been married over 20 years now, yes. uh, would celebrate what I was able to do that day. I could not do the, the day before. Good. And you take those little successes and that helped build your self-confidence because, uh, if you can look back and say, if I could open that milk carton yesterday when before it was impossible, today I can even do more. And that's how you get yourself motivated. Just take little steps at a time and keep making each step a little bit bigger because success is found outside of your comfort zone. That's great. <laughs> Chris, you are like motivation in a bottle. I love this. So did you did you do any type of writing in the past, early days, or was writing this book a first time uh, achievement. I've, done some, I've done some writing before I was on the junior high um, school newspaper. Okay. Um, I think for one year, I had done some writing in a, um, I was part of a, and I have to explain what this term is a PC users group, which were really big in the eighties and nineties. Yes. I'm, a, I'm that, I'm that old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these were little groups of people who had PC computers. This is before the internet is what it is today. And we would all get together and have maybe a guest speaker and we would help each other problem solve things. We did not know about the computer. So I did some writing for that newsletter for that group that I was a part of. And in, in school, uh, teachers always told me I had, I, I, I was good at writing and I thought, well, they're, they're trying to build my self confidence. I did not believe them, but yeah, I did a little bit of writing before I did write the book, but uh, I, not, not a significant amount of writing, but I did some. Good. Did you have anybody help you write this book at all? Or did you do it all on your own? I did it all on my own. My wife and a few other people helped me proofread it. Uh, and on there's still a couple of mistakes in there. I'm embarrassed to admit, but there are a couple. <laughs> but then I went to this meeting once and, and this person did this presentation and all. And, and at the end of the presentation slide, she had her name on it. And she had three people at her, at her place of employment review the PowerPoint slides, everything. And all three of them missed that they forgot to capitalize her name on the last screen. So I felt like <laughs> we all make mistakes. It makes me human. There you go. You fit in really well. That's what yes. I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have, I have so many mistakes. And I think if, if you're afraid of making mistakes, it's really hard to move forward, oh, whether yeah. physically for you. You know, to get up and to do the things, to, to make yourself mobile again. If you were afraid of mistakes, you would never move forward. But then writing is the same thing. If you are if you have a fear of mistakes, it's going to be really hard to get out there and write that first book. Yes, because uh, some people look at mistakes as failures. You haven't failed if you learn something from it. Right. That's what I tell people all the time. I love it. So tell us the name of the book. And a little bit more about it. Let's talk about that. The book that we're talking about, because I've written three, but the first one we're talking about right now is called It Doesn't Define Me, How I Rebuilt My Life After Surviving an Ischemic Stroke to My Spinal Cord. One thing I learned from that book, shorter titles. But I was writing the title for SEO, so people would type in certain words and find it. It's available exclusively on Amazon and paperback and Kindle format or through my website, which we may be able to give out later. Oh, yeah. uh, you can get an autographed copy if you're in the United States. No offense, you're up in Canada. Love the ca Canadian people. <laughs> but international postage is murder. It's terrible, <laughs> right? In the United States. So if you're in the United States, you're welcome to visit my website and and I'll send you an autograph copy if you pay for it. Yeah. I don't want to say I'll send you an autograph copy if you think hey, it's gonna be free. No, yeah. it's not. You gotta pay for the book. <laughs> and you'll get an autograph paperback copy. Nobody has wanted me to autograph the Kindle copy. For some reason, nope. they don't want me to put a Sharpie on their Kindle. I don't know. They're so picky. They're so that that is so picky. Yeah. Um oh. an autograph Kindle is a pretty big thing, I would think, with your name. Yeah, I would, it'd be very rare. Nobody else would have one. Uh. And you never forget my name. There you go. Tell us the response for book one. What, what did you hear back? What kind of what was what were readers telling you about the book? 
Uh, overall, is uh, people really enjoyed it and they found it somewhat inspirational, motivational. Um, some some of the people who read it who knew me did not know I had went through all that I've gone through to to fight to get my life back, um, the struggles that I face. Um, I share in the book my very first outing in public in a wheelchair, which was not exactly a great day for me. Mm. <laughs> I almost got I almost got hit by a car that day. So. Oh, boy. Uh, so uh, a lot of people it, it was surprised to know what I went through and uh, and it really helped them understand what I've been through in my life and what others go through that they do not always get to see and meet in public. So you are definitely living the next chapter, which is the name of my podcast, by going ahead and writing two more books. That's correct. Right. Yes. Two more books. So the tell, you're going to have to tell us about these ones as well, because I'm excited to to follow your journey as an author. What's book two? Book two. Well, and the interesting thing is book one and book two were kind of written at the same time. When I got stuck writing one book, I went and wrote the other and then back and forth. So, but the, the book two, <clears throat> which actually I released first, but book two is called the cheese ball clan. Who's your bully? And it's written for middle school grade kids, but adults have read it and enjoyed it as well. It's about the three kids are starting out in middle school and, and one of them is being bullied by somebody at school. And because it's kind of a mystery, I won't tell you who, okay. but they, they have to figure out who is bullying them and how to react to it before it destroys their friendship. Okay. So, so it's kind of, it got to be a story behind this that kind of sparked the idea to write this book, Chris. Can you tell us about that? Uh, actually, I have no idea what. I wrote that book. <laughs> I, I don't know. It just, I, I just wanted to challenge myself to write something. And I just thought that would be kind of a, a cool title. I was working at the time as a volunteer through Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Good. Uh, the Big Brothers, Big Sisters um, organization where I live at that time had what was called a lunch buddy program. So once a week I met with a um, junior high school, middle school student. And maybe that inspired me somewhat to write the book, but um, because I was have lunch with them once a week and got to be around um, junior high kids in the cafeteria. Maybe that influenced my writing of it. But yeah, it was a fun book to write. I really enjoyed writing it. A lot of people have asked me to write a sequel, but at this point, I'm not really interested in writing a sequel of that book. I'm more enjoying writing nonfiction. There you go. Because that one is a fiction book. Yeah. That's a totally different way to write, too, then. Yes, it is. What, yes, it is. What was the challenge to write that book? One was naming the characters. Okay. That was hard. Um because I wanted to I wanted to have names that would kind of go along with their personalities. And one of the hardest characters to name was the villain in the book, which I'm not gonna say the villain's mm -hmm. name because okay. it spoiled the ending. There you go. Good. <laughs> but it was inspired because I had another job at the um local hospital volunteering in the intensive care unit, answering phones and checking guests in. And we had this one person who uh, I'm not going to say even her title or anything, but she she wasn't there much longer after she got a bill from the hospital and got on the phone and started screaming at the um, billing department, which mm. you don't you usually scream at the company you work for. No. And she was n n uh, not all that friendly to be around, so I used her name as the um, villain in the book. Oh, there you go. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. So it's like that coffee cup or meme you've probably seen. Be nice to me or I'll kill you off in my next book. You know? you so if you want, if, if you don't want to be a villain in Chris's next book, be nice. Be nice. Be nice. Be nice. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay, so that's book two. And mm -hmm. then so you're like, I'm done. I'm not done writing. I'm not going to write anymore. No, no. There's still nope. another one. What's now yes, book there's three? another one. Um, book three is uh, uh, more nonfiction, and this is more like a um, personal self-help book. Success starts with self-confidence. The 10 steps to self-confidence for the self-employed person with a disability. Hmm. Yes, it's literally a longer title, but I got better SEO words this time, so I'm happy. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, can you give us a hint, like one of those steps maybe that we can share? Y yes. Yes, I will be happy to. Uh, the first step <clears> – <throat> Now, I, I don't mind talking about a couple of them. Okay. But the first step I talk about is self-acceptance. Now, we've not went into great detail here, but I'd like to just share a little backstory. Yeah. I'm a person with multiple disabilities. I have a obviously a physical disability. I My incomplete spinal cord injury in my 30s. 
but I was born with cataracts, so I'm legally blind. My vision is 2200 in my left eye, 2300 in my right, in my right which I also do not have deaf perception, which is really fun when you get around with a row later and wondering, is that a curb or is that a ramp? Mm. And you hope it's a ramp so you're not face plant into the road. Mm. I also am neurodiverse. I have ADHD. So I have a whole bunch of energy that's usually bouncing around and driving people up a wall. <laughs> so what I've done is uh, the first thing in the book, I talk about self-acceptance and accepting yourself as a person with a disability for who you are and accepting that disability is not a bad word. It's a good word. You're a wonderful, amazing person. You're a unique person. Bef because I say success starts with self-confidence and even before self-confidence, you have to have self-acceptance. You have to accept who you are, the way that you are. Mm -hmm. In the book, I talk about this poem I read from from Virginia Satare, I believe I'm pronouncing your last name right. And she wrote this in the early 1900s to a patient of hers. She was like a psychiatrist, psychologist, counselor, something like that. Uh, a young girl, teenage girl, who was uh, having a lot of questions about who she was. And in this poem called I Am Me, she uh, it's a beautiful poem. She explains that every part of you you own, and if there's any part of you you do not like, you can replace it with something different. And and I, I talk about that in the beginning of the book for self-acceptance. You might not be able to replace your disability, but you can change your attitude. And if you're a person that's always negative, you can become more positive. And we start with self-acceptance in that book. And we talk a lot about self-care in that first chapter as well. That it's important to spend each time, each day, a little time with yourself. And doing self-care, and, and that includes self-talk to pump yourself up so you can um, figure out what's going good in your life, what's going bad, and make the necessary changes to get more stuff in the good column than you have in the bad column. So, okay. So, Chris, it's one thing to say those amazing things, but I would love to hear what are some of the things that you're telling yourself? What is some of your positive self-talk? Can you give us a little sneak behind the curtain there? Sure, I'll be happy to. There are times that I struggle with things in life. Um, I struggle with uh, my ADHD or, or mobility issues and, and challenges. We all come up with challenges any single day. It could be disability related. It could be something else related. It could be a challenge in my business. And in the book, a little bit later in the book, I go more into detail about this. I have this concept I share with my uh, with readers, clients, anyone who's willing to listen to me, including my cat. The things <laughs> called success balloons. Mm -hmm. Now, the idea of the success balloon, and I'm getting to an answer to your question, I like it. Uh, is is this. It's a, a, a hot air balloon. It's an outline of a hot air balloon that you might find in a coloring book. And you write down even your smallest successes in your life. And you keep those. You can put them in a journal. You can put them in a pile of paper. You can put them up on the wall. It doesn't matter. So when you face a new challenge, you can look back and say, well, like I mentioned earlier, if I could do that when I once thought it was impossible, I could take on this next challenge. Then when you have enough success balloons, you can earn certificates and awards and achievements like you see in my wall behind yeah. me. If this is the video podcast, they can see it. If not, behind me is a wall with certificates and plaques and awards that I've earned. And whenever I face a challenge, I look back at that wall and say, look, if I could do that, I can do whatever I feel is challenging to me today. I've done other things before. I've overcome other hurdles. Uh, I don't have obstacles in my life. I have challenges. And I tell people, I have this mantra in life. I eat challenges for breakfast because they taste better than Cheerios. And some recent news reports have come out um, indicating Cheerios may have plastic in them. So it's a lot healthier than Cheerios <laughs> at times. <laughs> I don't want to get sued by Cheerios, but that's the news stories I'm hearing today that there may be some plastic in Cheerios. I, mean, I, I, I really do eat Cheerios. I mean, I'm going to go with muffins this morning. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, good thing we're not sponsored by Cheerios. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I've heard people say this before, too. Like, you know, you've done hard things in the past. You can do this, right? Same right. same, same mantra, same idea. I, I love that. That's a great way to stay motivated, stay on task. Oh, yes. Right? And find encouragement. Because sometimes, for people listening, there might be not there might not be somebody in the corner like you have with your amazing wife cheering you on and giving you the motivation to continue. They might be alone. And to have that self-talk is really important. 
Well, the, the important thing is my wife or anyone in the world could tell me how great I am. Right. But unless you believe it yourself, it's not going to really be that effective. Yeah. Because the the one voice I believe we listen to the most and our brain gives the most credibility to as a credible source is our inner voice. And, um, and, and in the book, I talk about this. And this is one of my favorite things to share with people is Bob the Bouncer. I have a Bob the Bouncer story. Bob the Bouncer is a little thing in your brain, little voice, little guy in your brain. You can picture him as a little guy in the brain or... Or Bob could be short for Roberta. It could be a little girl in yeah. your brain. Doesn't matter. There's no judgment here. Yeah, exactly. uh, and <laughs> all day you hear this negative stuff. You can't do that, especially in the disabled community. You may hear you're disabled. You can't do this. You can't do this. And all the barriers that we face in the disabled community. Then somebody says, you know what? You're a wonderful, talented person. Well, Bob the Bouncer says, that's not the normal narrative that we hear. So Bob the Bouncer prevents that from getting into your brain. And he laid all that other garbage in. So we got to fire Bob, uh, either retrain or fire Bob the Bouncer and start leading in that negative. Uh, stay, start leading in the positive and stop leading in the negative. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- there's a movie I love called um, Police Academy, Police Academy 4, and um, Steve Gutenberg in it and G.W. Yeah. Bailey. Yeah. And there's a scene at the beginning where – Gutenberg's character, Sergeant Mahoney, who's kind of a, not exactly by the books, kind of a more laid back cop, is reunited with G.W. Bailey's character of Captain Harris, who's more by the book. Mm-hmm. And uh, Captain Harris said to Mahoney, has anyone told you lately, and I'm going to paraphrase because it's a little bit um, sentence enhances in it. <laughs> has anyone told you lately that you're still a little nothing, Mahoney? And Mahoney, without missing a beat, said, not anyone whose opinion matters to me, sir. Mm. And that's the important thing. When someone tells you negative, don't let their negative opinion or belief about you become something you believe about yourself. Wow. That is, I I know that scene in the movie now, and it resonates even more hearing you explain it that way. That's great. That scene helped me a lot because one thing we've not mentioned, I grew up with a father who was a functioning alcoholic and very verbally abusive. And that helped me put into perspective when my dad was being verbally abusive to me. Right. There's that whole thing about hurt people, hurt people, and you don't know what's going on in somebody's life. But, you know, the impact of who we are and how we show up in the world definitely has a ripple effect into all of our relationships as well. Yes, it does. Yeah. There's Chris, you, I see 20 more books in your future because you are just, <laughs> there's so much positivity that you're bringing out oh, and, thank you. and encouragement that you're bringing out. The one thing I'd love to get your opinion on, Chris, that would maybe help all of us a little bit to show up to be better humans is when we come across someone that has a visible, um, you know, Issues that they're working through, whether they're in a, a wheelchair or crutches or there's something where, where like we can see that there's something that, you know, they're struggling with and there's there's a change that's happened in their life. But then there's those that we don't see a visible, any kind of visible things that make us go, that person's dealing with something. So we don't treat them or give them special help or assistance or thought. How do we work with people and and show up better in the world with people who don't have a visible uh, disability and it's kind of hidden? Is there a way that we can be a better person to them? There's four words that will answer that question. And this comes from a a morning radio show I used to listen to. Uh, They they wrapped up the show, I think, about 10 plus years ago. Mark and Brian, some people may know who Mark and Brian is. Some won't. It's okay. They were based out of L.A. and were in about 21 markets. And at the end of the show, Brian, uh, Mark and Brian, always ended the show with four words. Be a good human. Mm-hmm. And that's all that we do. And in fact, when I was in the Lunch Buddy program with my uh, Lunch Buddy through BBBS, at the end of the uh, time we met each other, I would always fist bump him and say, be a good human. And that was my way of sounding like a, you know, uh, a stuffy old adult tell him to be good and be behave. I always told him, be a good human. And that was our way of saying that we're going to uh, do the best that we can do to be decent people to ourselves and to others and make um, 
others around us proud of what we do and just be a good human treat people with a disability with respect and courtesy the same way you would want to be treated uh, treated whether they have a disability or working system issues whether you know it or not treat every single person you meet as a decent human being the way you will want to be treated the way you want to be treated and do it in the way you would in real life not the way you do it online there's some people online who are wonderful people in person but they get behind that computer screen and they become the biggest jerks you'll ever meet and they they um um bully each other they troll all of that stuff Treat people the way you would treat them if you were face-to-face -face with them, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. Always remember there's a human being there. Um, whether they can communicate or not, there's a human being with feelings and treat them decently. It's great words to live by. Chris, I love this. Um, so, Chris, we talked about earlier, you, we mentioned that you're, you have a website as well that people can connect with. Can we talk a little bit about what we find and where your website is? Well, my website is on the internet. I just had to say that. That popped <laughs> in my mind. There you go. It, that's the best place for them to be really? for some reason. They okay. work better on the internet than so on a billboard somewhere on the back of a Cheerios box. That's a great, um, good answer. I love that. Cheerios is a great product. I don't want to get sued. Uh, <laughs> it is located at defineyourself.us d-e-f-i-n-e y-o-u-r s-e-l-f dot u-s and I'm not rubbing it in your face I'm an American you're not but I could not get to find yourself well I could get to find yourself dot com if I want to pay ten thousand no. dollars and I said no thank you no, we're good. <laughs> yeah I'll get another domain and and there you're going to find um, connections to all three all three of my books yep including the success dose for self-confidence that's um, coming out sometime in 2024, probably before summer. Um, we're going through some proofing right now and where you can buy autographed copies of my book or we'll take you to a link to buy it on Amazon. You're going to be able to find uh, my past guest appearances on podcasts, including this podcast. Yay. So if you, if you ever misplace this podcast, well, you're probably listening now. You probably not misplaced it, but you can use it to tell your friends that I was on this one. And it also has links to my podcast that I host called Successful, Self-Employed, and Disabled on there. And we have a, uh, a free gift for people, too. Oh, come on. And that's at a, um, a special URL called successstartswithselfconfidence.com. And if you go there, you um, give me your email address and your name so I can send it to you. And I don't sell any of this information. I'm not into that. I hate spam myself. Yeah. You will get a free PDF that with three actionable steps you can start doing today to discover, develop, and grow your self-confidence. Now, yes, I primarily work with people in the disabled community. I am a certified confidence life coach who serves uh, persons with disabilities who um, want to start or grow a self-employed business because in the disabled community, traditional employment is very difficult. We have a very high unemployment rate, but we are rocking it in self-employment. So I, I work with people who want to develop and grow their self-confidence to start and launch and grow a business, but anyone can benefit from these three tips. So it's at success starts for self-confidence.com and you get a free little PDF. It's called a cheat sheet. It's one page long. Okay. Uh, the tips are, and it will give you three things you can start doing today to develop, discover, develop, and grow your self-confidence. I love it. I love it. One thing we talked about, Chris, when we met earlier was you gave me a really high percentage stat, which I love to kind of chat about as we end off our conversation today about the people that struggle with self-confidence. You threw out a yes. big number and I, yes. you caught me by it's surprise. Amazing. Can you talk about this? Yes. Now I'm going to ask a question here. We're going to have a pause here for people to kind of say, okay, we can't okay. hear them, but Good. I want them to think <laughs> on their own. What percentage of people do you think struggle with self-confidence? Pause for a fact. The answer is, is 86 percent wow and that's not just in the disabled community it's everywhere it does not matter if you're low income medium income high income an american a canadian what your nationality is your ethnicity your religious beliefs your your sexual orientation whether you're disabled or not 86 percent of us across the board in every demographic struggle with self-confidence so if there were 10 people in the room and I asked how many people are struggling with self-confidence only five people raised their hand there's at least three people who are so uh 
uh, have such a low amount of self confidence and not even confident enough to raise their hand. Mm. So, eighty six. So there's no shame in admitting that you struggle with self confidence. Eight to nine out of ten people struggle with it. So it's very common, and we do this because we live in a society. This is my belief uh, that has so much negativity in it, and. You see it all the time. You see it on social media. You see it in the news. All we do is tear down people. And that does not help anyone's self-confidence. And I'm going to tell you guys a little secret here, a little tip. Because you tear down somebody does not build up your self-confidence. Don't tear down other people to make yourself look better. It doesn't. Because what's going to happen is you're going to start doing this and, oh, I feel great. Then you're going to get paranoid that, are people judging me? And that's going to tear up your self-confidence. So stop judging people. Mm. <laughs> um Chris I a I think you are probably one of the most positive people that I've met in a very very long time. Um I would think that if I had any type of physical thing that happened to me I would probably wallow in bitterness and anger get very self-defeated probably lose a little bit of my spark and maybe stay in that space for a long, long time. For you, I don't get that from you. I get positivity. I get encouragement, support. I get a person that is giving to the world something that we need more of. There's something special about who you are and what you're putting out into the world. I just, there's, it's, it's amazing to have you here with me on the podcast. It really is. Well, thank you. And what you were talking about, you know, if you were physically disabled or something to that effect, and whether you're physically disabled or not, there are people who do this, wallow in, 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 in it and wallow in self petty. And the two things I, I say about that, first of all, I don't go to pity parties. Mm. I don't send me an invitation. I won't come. <laughs> There's usually not any really good cake or beverages, no. and it's usually a downer attitude. Right. So we don't want to go to those. And number two, that is called a victim mentality, and that will hold you back in life. You cannot play the victim, and we have a lot of people who play the victim who are not disabled um, in all arenas, including political arenas. Uh, we 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 love the victim mentality. Oh, poor me. And mm -hmm. Everyone should feel sorry for me, and everyone should understand me, and nobody understands me but people like me. Yeah, well, and then it's not their job to understand you. It's your job to, to look at the things that are in your life that are, um, are holding you back. And look at them in a different lens. Don't look at them as barriers or obstacles. Because when there's a barrier or obstacle in front of you, you get so laser focused on it. All you see is that. So you got to start looking at them, like I said earlier, as challenges. And a challenge is something you could take on and more than likely overcome. And if you don't overcome it, you're still going to be a stronger person for trying. Chris, I, I, I kind of was joking about the 20 more books you need to write, but I think you still need to keep putting stuff out in the world. There's something, again, special about you well, and, you. and how you show up. I, I'm so, I'm so happy that we've connected. It's amazing. Thank you. It's amazing. So we're going to put links to all of your information. I love the, um, success starts with, selfconfidence.com. We'll have links to that. We'll have links to your defineyourself.us because it's not .com because it's too expensive. We'll have all yeah. of that in there. Um, any last words of encouragement that we can put out into the world from you, Chris? Yeah, two or three. First of all, I don't mind getting defineyourself.com if people do not mind paying $5,000 for a book. So <laughs> There you go. <laughs> it's a good idea. Two books and I'll have the domain. There you go. So that probably will not happen. Also, from my website, I do have a YouTube channel uh, called Define Yourself Stream that has over 270 videos. Most of them are um, videos of me talking about self-confidence and how you can uh, grow it and develop it and protect it, as well as episodes of my podcast and all. But the the, the one thing I like to leave with um, people here is this. Regardless if you're a person with a disability or not, regardless of how you identify as a person with a disability, whether it be neurodiverse, ADHD, uh, visual, hearing, um, 
probably hearing that listening right now, but you know, unless of the transcript here, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, a mental, whatever your disability is, you are an amazing person and don't let anyone tell you differently. And if someone tells you you can't do something, go out and do it. Don't do it to prove them wrong, but to prove to yourself that you can do it. Because the only person you have to get better than each day is a person you were yesterday. Start with the milk carton and work your way up from there. That's right. All right. Excellent. Uh, Chris, I want to have you back in the future. I don't know how or when we can do this, but I just need to have a little bit more of you. All right. Okay. Well, we can we can work that out. All right, everyone. All the information for Chris is included in the show notes. As always, please go to his YouTube channel, hit that like, subscribe, follow, ring the bell, do mm -hmm. all the things. And let everybody know that there's somebody out there putting positivity out into the world in droves. It's amazing to have somebody like this in the world. Support Chris by all three of his books and be waiting for the next 20 because I think yeah. we need more of Chris in this world. So, Chris, again, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much for having me today. And thank you for your wonderful audience and allowing me to speak to them today. Hey, well, thank you for listening. It's a new year, and we're excited to be releasing even more great episodes of Living the Next Chapter. And we want you to come along for the journey. Thank you for being here. If you know of an author that you would love to have featured on the podcast, an author that you enjoy, an author that brings you that excitement, that you would just love to hear them interviewed on this podcast, I would love to hear your suggestion for a future guest and some what would be a question or two that you would want us to ask them on your behalf go to living in the next chapter.com there's a little speak pipe icon there you can leave me a voice message tell me who should be on the show and give me some question ideas and i'll use your request and reach out to that author and invite them on and give you full credit for the idea living the next chapter.com would love to hear your suggestion and thank you for listening catch you on the next episode hey there fellow parent if you're anything like me balancing screen time for our kids is a constant struggle that's why i want to share a little secret with you kids pod it's this amazing app i found that's packed with podcasts just for kids imagine stories learning and fun all without the screen it's been a game changer in our house, keeping my kids engaged and their imaginations running wild. And guess what? It's completely free. So download KidsPod today. Trust me, it's a decision you won't regret.